My name is Steve Densley. I'm the Executive Vice President of Fair Mormon. I wanted to take a, a brief moment to mention a service that Fair Mormon provides that you might not be aware of. It's called the Fair Mormon Journal. And it's a service that uh, is a free service we provide once a month. We send an email newsletter out to you that contains uh, information about what's been going on in the world of Mormon apologetics during the last month. You can find um, links to blog posts and podcasts and YouTube videos. Uh, you can also find uh, discounts for books. So to find the Fair Mormon Journal and sign up for it, if you go to our website at fairmormon.org, there's a link there for signing up for things. You click on that, go there, and you can find a page where you can sign up to receive the Fair Mormon Journal, the Fair Mormon front page, the YouTube channel, uh, updates from the blog. Uh, so I want to make sure you all knew about that and you can be updated on what's going on with Fair Mormon. Now let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Barry Robert Bickmore is a member of the geology department at BYU. He's also on the editorial staff of BYU Studies. He's authored a number of articles for Fair Mormon and for the Farms Review, and he's written one of my favorite books. It's called Restoring the Ancient Church. Uh, th this book is so good that Dan Peterson said that he wished he'd written it. <laughs> it's, it's so good that uh, when I was reading it about eight or nine years ago, I would wake up in the morning excited to get out of bed so I could start reading it again. You know, and it's so good that once I finished reading it, I wanted to buy copies for everyone I knew, which is actually how I got a copy. I think my father-in-law finished reading it, and he bought a copy for everyone he knew. Uh, he gave one to me, and I wanted to buy copies. I went to the Fair Mormon bookstore. I went to uh, BYU bookstore. I went to... Uh, went to the Deseret Bookstore, I went to Amazon.com, and I could only get eight copies. It was out of print by then. So I bought all eight copies, gave them away. And, and so I'm excited now that we've got a second edition. You can get your copy here today. Barry will be signing them down here. It's, it's uh, just an excellent book. I'm excited to hear from uh, Barry Robert Bickmore. Okay, in contrast to Marvin, I'm going to tell you that you should believe everything I say. <laughs> You'll recognize the Jedi mind trick if you're a Star Wars fan. So, uh, do I just... Is the PowerPoint up? Or Almost. Anyway, um, the last time I spoke at a, a fair Mormon conference was the first of these conferences in Ben Lomond, California, um, which didn't turn out to be a very good place to have the conference because uh, the speakers far outnumbered the in other uh, attendees. So, didn't... Uh, really? I keep hearing squeaking. Okay. Uh, turn your, turn your uh, uh, hearing aids down because I'm coming. Okay, so the first time I talked in Ben Lomond, uh, California, FAIR was just publishing one of the first two books they published, like uh, uh, Steve said, it's uh, Restoring the Ancient Church, Joseph Smith and Early Christianity. So I just, I'd written this book uh, while I was in graduate school um, because I have ADD, because I'm a geologist, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and now they, decided to resurrect me from the dead and bring me back because they just published the second edition of this book which is expanded a little bit uh, to include some different things. Now, uh, I, I, I wrote this book for several reasons. One of them, you can see here, this is me when I was three years old and you can just compare and see that uh, it has to be that every day since this point in time I must have been getting uglier. And that really explains pretty much everything I've done in my life, except the things that I blame on my mother, who's sitting right over there. Okay, so the other reason I, uh, I wrote this is because I was one of those poor young 19-year-old saps that the church uh, dumped in a, a, bio, a Bible Belt mission. Oh, and you know, if I had paid attention in seminary and things like that instead of sleeping, uh, 
my life would have been so much easier in the Bible Belt, but, but I learned a few things along the way. And one of those was that if I could get myself to just relax and listen to people what, to what people had to say and, and ask them about why they believe this and why they believe that and, and uh, just try and put myself in their shoes. Number one, it made me a better teacher because I could understand what the real issues were. Because I found a lot of times we would argue about fake issues. Uh, for instance, I found out that the, the common Mormon conception of the Trinity isn't what they're supposed to believe, typically. A lot of people actually believe something similar to what we think they believe, but they're not supposed to because they can't, and, you know, it's, it's hard to understand. So, but, but we hate it when people do that to us, right? They have some misconception and they, about what we believe, and no matter what you say, you can't uh, uh, pry that out of their brains. Um, and so I felt like I, we should really listen to people and understand what they're, they're thinking and why they're thinking it. And I found out that uh, most of the time, I could sort of understand where they were coming from. And I could say, well, yeah, I don't interpret that particular Bible scripture that way, but I can see why somebody else would if they came at the text with different assumptions. Now, the assumptions and background uh, that you come in with really determine how you're going to read a text like the Bible. And the problem is that we're, uh, you know, at least a couple thousand years uh, removed and culturally even farther removed, probably, um, from the people who wrote this. And so the, the idea that we can just pick up this thing and understand it completely is uh, ludicrous. So I got interested in... Uh, historical studies about uh, the people who wrote and believed the uh, shortly afterward uh, after it was written the New Testament texts. Anyway, so the question um, that I had was how good can we make the case for the proposition that Joseph Smith restored something akin to the earliest form of Christianity? So, uh, because, you know, I had heard some things and read a few things, but it was pretty spotty stuff. Now, of course, the, one of the first uh, uh, places a curious young Latter-day Saint like myself would go would be to this book by Hugh Nibley. And there were other books that covered some of the same topics as well. Uh, so Hugh Nibley's book is Mormonism and Early Christianity. But what I found out was that uh, some of the books I thought were just really overly simplistic. Um, I didn't feel like they were, they were um, giving all the information you needed to understand what was really going on sometimes, um, or some of the interpretations were a little bit tendentious. I thought Hugh Nibley's uh, book was fantastic, but it took me a lot of work to even understand or feel like I understood what he was talking about. Um, so that's why I set out to write this book, and that was uh, because I wanted to produce something that was a lot more accessible to regular people like me who aren't specialists in this kind of uh, thing, um, and make sort of the book that I wish I had had when I was starting to study the topic. Okay, so today I'm going to just take a small part of what's covered in there. Um, and give you an idea of the kind of argument we can make based on the scriptures and historical early Christian sources um, to support our interpretation of the scriptures. And the, the topics I chose were um, the doctrine of God, so theology and anthropology, which is the, the teachings about the nature of man, okay? So, as everyone in this room probably uh, would know that this is one of the things that really sets us apart from uh, other Christian groups. And it's the thing that if they're going to say that Mormons aren't Christians or something like that, this is the thing that they will mention as the number one reason why we can't possibly be Christians. Um, the, the Catholics, uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, has had a centuries and centuries long tradition of accepting the baptisms 
done by heretical groups. But they a few years ago, they announced they weren't going to accept uh, Mormon baptisms anymore because of the, and it was largely because of the doctrine of God and our differences there. Okay, so just to, I'll give you a little rundown of, of what uh, the differences are. So main, uh, mainstream Christians uh, believe that God is a unique spiritual substance. So this I'm quoting from the, uh, Vatican, uh, the First Vatican Council. And uh, this unique spiritual substance is supposed to be simple, they call it, which means completely homogenous. There are no divisions, it's all the same throughout. It's immutable, so unchangeable completely. Um, it's immaterial, so the, there's the material world and the spiritual world, they're different, separate. And uh, this is completely spiritual and immaterial. And it's always exist existed in exactly the same uh, form. Now, they also believe that this simple, uh, unique spiritual substance is composed of three distinct persons in a single being. Now, that, that's the real difficulty with the Trinity is not that there's uh, people, they're not supposed to believe that there's um, one person that manifests in, in three ways. That's a heresy called modalism. What they're supposed to believe is that these are three actual different persons that comprise this uh, single being. Now, how you can have three, uh, three distinct persons who comprise a, an, a completely simple or homogenous um, being, it, that, that's the real trouble, or lo I think it's a logical contradiction, but, but uh, for them, it's just something that humans aren't ready to fully understand, so it's a mystery. For humans, uh, mainstream Christians will be, believe that uh, humans have a spirit, but it's fundamentally different than God's spirit because they believe in the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, which is Latin for creation out of nothing. And when they say nothing, they mean absolutely nothing. So before the creation, there was God and there was nothing. Okay? God was the only thing there. And so that... Uh, this doctrine that everything else was created from nothing, including the spirits of mankind, um, really puts a gulf of separation between uh, God's being and human beings. Um, they are fundamentally different, and there's nothing that can be done to change that because one is uncreated and the other one is created out of nothing. Now, um, they'll believe that humans can become one in God, but this oneness is different than the oneness among the Trinity, okay? Um, and sometimes, some of them will even speak of becoming gods with a, a little g. So this is even in the current Catholic catechism, I believe, and uh, uh, the Orthodox churches have taught this all the time. Um, so the idea of deification in some sense, at least, is not unique to the Latter-day Saints. Um, but you can say because, again, of this uh, doctrine of Cratio ex nihilo, um, we can't make it all the way. There's always going to be a, a gulf of separation. Okay, LDS Christians, on the other hand, believe that God has a spirit and a body, both material. So we, we don't put this distinction I mean, we believe there's a difference between spirit and what we normally call matter, but we believe that uh, spirit is a kind of material substance itself. So there's not this big distinction uh, between these types of things. Um, but we believe that God has a, a human form. His body and his spirit are both in human form. Now, we believe he's always existed in some form, but he's not immutable in every way. We believe in eternal progression for everybody. Um, and uh, God can grow in glory as more of his children come to salvation. Um, the Godhead is, uh, so the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for us, is spoken of as being one um, 
sometimes in the scriptures. I mean, you can look it up in the Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Mormon. It says there's one God. When we say that, what do we mean? Well, we mean that there's one Father. Um, also, we mean that any others that are included, like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, they're one in will, love, and covenant. We also talk about um, God being more than one. So when we say that, we mean there's more than one being. So there's none of this idea that there's more than one person who comprise one being. Now, we also believe that the Son and the Spirit, well, let me go back. Um, so the Son and Spirit are support, subordinate to the Father in rank and glory. So there's a hierarchy within the Trinity. Now, when it comes to humans, uh, we believe that humans have spirits that are the literal offspring of God, the, the same species, so to speak. Uh, but not the same thing, more like, uh, you know, a caterpillar is the same species as a butterfly uh, or something like that. Um, now, we believe that these spirits have always existed in some form, but not, uh, we don't believe that they're immutable in every way. Okay, so they've always existed somehow, at least. Uh, and then we've changed over time as we become more like God. We believe in creatio ex materia, so that means creation out of pre-existing materials. So we don't believe that there was God and then there was nothing when the creation happened. We believe that there was God and then there was everything else. And God created the, what there is out of that stuff. So you can see how this uh, makes there be a sort of a much less of a gulf, gulf of se uh, separation between the being of God and human beings. Um, and so therefore, um, the logical extension of this is our belief that uh, humans are be be capable of becoming gods in essentially the same way as the Father, although we would always be subordinate to him and to uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So um, there's some real differences here. So the question is, um, how are we going to attack this problem? Uh, how are we going to go back and build a historical case that the LDS uh, interpretation of the scriptures um, is plausible. Now, I, I drew this uh, diagram, and you can tell several things from this diagram. Number one, I am an awful, awful artist. And my, my Adobe Illustrator skills are, are really poor. But rest assured, it would have been much, much worse if I'd tried to hand draw it. Anyway, what this uh, insect or spaceship looking thing is supposed to be telling you is that, uh, if my pointer will work here. No, it's not working. Okay, so in the middle, I have the original Jewish Christianity. Well, this isn't controversial that the original Christianity was Jewish. Jesus was a Jew, all the apostles were Jewish. Um, all the original converts, for the most part, were Jewish. Even when Paul began preaching to the Gentiles, whenever he went to a city, the first place he would go would be to the synagogue. And he would talk to the Jews, but also to um, Gentiles who were attracted to Judaism. The, the book of Acts calls them God-fearers. Uh, so they would hang around the synagogue, and they generally believed uh, um, Jewish theology and that kind of thing, but uh, they didn't really want to get circumcised, if you know what I mean. So, so even the Gentiles that were converted, for the most part, um, were, had a very Jewish character. So it was dominated by Jewish thought forms and traditions and things like that. But as we, we would say the apostasy occurred, or even if you don't believe uh, the apostasy happened, um, the earliest form of Christianity began to split apart into different splinter groups. Um, and we, I've, I've divided them into three groups. We have Jewish Christianity, and there were a lot of different Jewish Christian uh, groups, and there's sort of a spectrum between all three of these. But um, these Jewish Christian groups, uh, you know, they're, they're mentioned in the New Testament, some of them, uh, that uh, 
the, they had trouble with the Judaizers, for instance, not being able to let go of certain aspects of the law of Moses, um, and there were other things as well. But their problems with the original Christianity were sort of more Jewish in character. Um, there was Gnostic Christianity. Now, these were really weird groups, a lot of them. So, uh, Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. And uh, these people believe that you were actually saved by knowledge. And uh, they generally believed that the material world was evil, not just you know, secondary or, or something like that, but actually evil. And so most of them believed that Jesus wasn't really uh, incarnate. It was all sort of an illusion where he was sort of a hologram that would come down and interact with people, but he didn't really uh, become part of the material world because uh, that would be taking evil on himself. So, uh, but they they were really into uh, um, esoteric rites and things like that. So some of the things that uh, uh, were part of the temple rituals and things like that, they uh, kept hold of for a while. Now the main branch here is what I call, or what is called, I, I didn't make this up, Hellenized Christianity. So Hellene is, is just the Greek word for Greek, okay? So uh, at the time, it was the Roman Empire ruling thing, but the culture at the time was really Greek. Um, so, I mean, if you look around the Mediterranean world, the, the lingua franca was, was Greek, and uh, um, the culture was, was stemmed from the Greeks, the intellectual life uh, stemmed from the, the Greek philosophers that had come before. So there's this uh, really powerful cultural and intellectual tradition that the gospel moved out into. And as that happened, they uh, started accepting uh, or harmonizing the gospel with more of uh, the, the sort of secular uh, concepts that you would have gotten from the Greek philosophers. And introducing elements of Greek culture as well. Um, and that, uh, that branch, uh, you know, the Jewish and Gnostic uh, Christian groups, they eventually petered out and either uh, just died out or were absorbed back into the uh, Hellenized church, which is what uh, became the Catholic, uh, what we'll call Catholic Christianity. And that's Catholic with a little c, because the Roman Catholic Church didn't uh, um, split off from the Orthodox churches until later, but Catholic just means uh, universal. So uh, all the splinter groups had mainly been stomped out by this time after a few hundred years, and we had this uh, uh, more homogenous movement, movement by that time. So what sources are we gonna look for? What, I mean, if, if you look at this, what's clear is that in this explosion of different groups, there's going to be a lot of different ideas expressed. So we can go back and pick and choose and, and uh, um, try and support our doctrines by miscellaneous things said by various groups. Um, and, and that's uh, reasonable to do as sort of a first survey of what's going on and see if there's anything er out there that we can look into. Um, but on the other hand, at some point, we want to make sort of a coherent historical story about what happened in the apostasy. Um, so what I'm gonna to do today is pick a particular set of doctrines, the ones about, uh, like I said, the ones about uh, God and man's relationship to God. And I'm going to focus on Jewish Christian sources uh, for the most part and just the very earliest Hellenized uh, Christian sources as well. So, um, and the reason for that is because um, that would have been the sort of the intellectual milieu in which the, the first Christianity uh, was born. And so we wanna see if we can go back and find very similar doctrines among these, uh, these groups. Now that's hard because the Jewish Christian sources, uh, like I said, that, that's the most interesting to us, I think, the inter most interesting branch, but it's probably the one we have the least sources for. Um, and so, so we're 
we have a few sources plus some secondhand uh, accounts and things like that. Uh, but we'll see what we can find. Okay, one thing I wanted to emphasize was that all of these different uh, directions were condemned in the New Testament. So, for instance, uh, Paul says in his letter to Titus, um, he, t he talks about giving heed to Jewish fables. So there were Jewish people there that were, were corrupting the gospel. Um, in the first letter to Timothy, he talks about the gnosis falsely so-called. In the King James, it says science, but I, I don't like that because I'm a scientist. But gnosis is just the Greek word for knowledge. So anyway, most, most translations translate it just knowledge falsely so-called. But um, these Gnostic groups were, were popping up already uh, during New Testament times. Um, in the, his letter to Colossians, he says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. So there were already uh, some clashes with the um, Greek philosophy uh, that was current in the day, even back uh, when Paul was writing. Now, there are a, lot of, there, there are a number of different sources uh, that you can pick up and read about uh, early Jewish Christianity. One of the best ones, I think, was by Jean Danielou, uh, he wrote a book called The Theology of Jewish Christianity. Now, he was a Catholic historian who also became a, a cardinal later on. But anyway, he wrote this book. He says, the thesis is that there was a first form of Christian theology expressed in Jewish Semitic terms. So he, you know, tries to use whatever sources he can find and reconstruct what kinds of things were going on in that sort of milieu. Okay, so here's another quote uh, from him. He says, if we now examine the forms of thought and philosophical systems current at the time when Christianity first made its appearance in the world, it is clear they were wholly antagonistic thereto. So he's talking about the Greek philosophical systems, uh, Middle Platonism, uh, Stoicism, and the like, um, that were current at the time and the Christians did not like them, and they didn't like the Christians. For one thing, the Platonists thought of the, the material world as sort of a little bit illusory. Um, I mean, it really existed, but the true reality was more the, the world of the mind or uh, the spiritual world. There were some points of contact bet between Christianity and Middle Platonism. Um, but for the most part... It had to be antagonistic because if you believe the material world is a secondary, corrupted sort of thing, how can you believe that uh, God became part of the material world? So that was a real issue. So that's why um, um, Paul said that uh, in another place that uh, the gospel was to the Greeks foolishness. Now here's another, this is an Anglican scholar, uh, James Scheel. He says, within a few generations of the apostles, one comes upon a reverse situation. The religious message is now framed in philosopher's language. Indeed, the Christian religion is now occasionally called a philosophy, and its founder described as a philosopher. So there was a big change, and this happened starting in the mid-second century or so, and really took off from there as um, the Jewish Christian uh, groups died off. Now here's an example of what a Middle Platonist philosopher would say about God. This is Plutarch, who lived uh, around uh, AD 46 to 120. Um, he says, God is the one, the single self-existent nature, the monadic, the real being, the good. God therefore is mind, a separate species, that is to say what is purely immaterial and unconnected with anything passable. Passable means changeable. So you can see, this is really the origin of some of the beliefs, uh, the mainstream Christian beliefs about what God is and what uh, this unique spiritual substance. This came straight out of Greek philosophy with only slight modifications. And when I say that, this is, this is not just me, this is completely uncontroversial to say that among scholars who study the early Christian history. Um, completely standard. In fact, if you asked uh, some of the people, um, James Scheel and Jean Danielou, um, that write these things, they would say that it was a good thing. 
because it sort of put uh, Christianity on more of a rational footing. Okay, here's an example of a Hellenized Christian author. Um, this is Tertullian. He was uh, uh, writing around 280 or so. Um, and here's what he says. Whatever attributes, therefore, you require as worthy of God must be found in the Father, who is invisible and unapproachable and placid, and, so to speak, the God of the philosophers. So once again, if the early Christians, uh, after, you know, after this period of Hellenization, if they were saying, oh, we believe in the God of the, the philosophers, well, it's, it's not really controversial to say that. Now, here's another Hellenized uh, Christian, uh, early to mid third century. His name is Oregon. Uh, and he was the top scholar in the, the Christian church at the time. I mean, everybody went to this guy. But uh, anyway, he was all for the philosophers. But he says, uh, the Jews indeed, but also some of our people, meaning Christians, suppose that God should be understood as a man that is adorned with human members and human appearance. But the philosophers despise these stories. So he goes on to say why it's so dumb to think that. But he already admitted that the Jews, from which the Christian church came, and the, some of the Christians, presumably the Jewish Christians, believed that God had a body in human form. Here's another quotation by Oregon. He says, For it is also to be a subject of investigation how God himself is to be understood, whether as corporeal, meaning having a body, and formed again according to some shape, or of a different nature from bodies, a point which is not clearly indicated in our teaching. So in the early third century, Oregon, the top scholar in the church, could admit that questions like these, whether God has a body or uh, has a sh whether that body has a shape and so on, um, the, he, he could admit that this was a topic that wasn't really uh, settled in the church, even as late as the third century. Now, this next uh, quotation I'm going to um, show you is from a document called the Clementine Homilies. Now, this is a Jewish Christian document written uh, by some Jewish Christian uh, group in the third or fourth centuries, and it's thought to have come from second century source materials. And uh, there's another book goes along with it called the Clementine Recognitions. But this Clementine literature, again, is thought to stem out of second century early Jewish Christianity. And um, it's, it's some of the few large documents we have from, from Jewish Christian sources. But here's what, uh, in, in these books, it's the story of uh, Clement of Rome, how he gets converted and he, uh, he meets Peter and uh, he uh, follows Peter around. So a lot of it is chronicling some supposed conversations between Peter and various people and sermons uh, Peter gave, confrontations between uh, Peter and Simon Magus, things like that. So this is a confrontation uh, between Simon Magus and Peter. It says, and Simon said, I should like to know, Peter, if you really believe that the shape of man has been molded after the shape of God. And Peter said, I am really quite certain, Simon, that this is the case. It is the shape of the just God. So the idea that uh, God had a human form, this was commonplace among Jewish Christians. Okay, so uh, I have a but wait here. Because if you start discussing this with uh, our uh, fellow Christians from other denominations, they might bring up this passage. Well, because in the Bible, they know that in the Bible, there are several uh, cases where people saw God and they say he had a human, you know, they describe him as having a human form and so on. But they would say, well, that's just sort of a visionary uh, metaphorical representation. And we know that because John said that no man hath seen God at any time. So whatever those visionary things were, it wasn't God, uh, really. It was just some representation of him. Now, LDS people can come back and say, well, our belief is that um, it, it's explained in the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. 
And uh, in one verse, uh, Moses says, For behold, I could not look upon God except his glory should come upon me, and I were transfigured before him. So our belief is that, yeah, people can't see God, or they, otherwise they would get toasted. Um, and so, in order for that to happen, we have to be transfigured or changed in sort of a, into sort of a heavenly being ourselves. At least temporarily. Now, if we look in the Clementine homilies, we find Peter saying essentially the same thing. He says, For he who sees God cannot live, for the excess of light dissolves the flesh on, of him who sees, unless by the secret power of God the flesh be changed into the nature of light so that it can see light. So, it's, I mean, it's one thing to have sort of general categories confirmed, but this is a quirky little detail in LDS theology that is confirmed exactly in these old Jewish Christian sources. Now, the, the next part of the doctrine I wanted to talk about is subordinationism. Now, subordinationism is the name of a doctrine that says, the Son and the Holy Spirit are God, but they're subordinate to the Father in rank and glory. Now, this is a, a quotation from R.P.C. Hansen, an Ang Anglican historian. Um, I think he was an Anglican bishop, the Bishop of London as well. He said, indeed, until Athanasius began writing, so that would be in the fourth century, about uh, 380 or so, every single theologian East and West had postulated some form of subordinationism. It could, about the year 300, have been described as a fixed part of Catholic theology. And even after the Nicene Council, um, this was still the standard position. That's how people interpreted some of the language of the Nicene Creed. Uh, they interpreted it in a way that meant, well, yeah, they're God, but there's still a hierarchy in there which is absolutely not believed. This is a, a heresy according to mainstream Christian theologians nowadays. Okay, so here's one, another uh, passage from one of these uh, Clementine uh, literature, uh, the books of the Clementine literature, the Clementine recognitions. So this is Peter talking again. He says, but to the one among the archangels who is greatest, was committed the government of those who before all other others received the worship and knowledge of the Most High God. Thus the princes of the several nations are called gods, but Christ is God of princes who is judge of all. So in this case, this was another commonplace um, in early Jewish Christian, uh, Christianity, and it was actually fairly common within the Hel Hellenized branch of Christianity as well, for a while at least. Uh, it's called uh, angelomorphic or angelic uh, or angel Christology, meaning that they believe that Christ was sort of the head angel. And this really resonates with what we believe because we, do we believe there's any fundamental difference between um, Christ's spirit and that of the, the archangels and things like that? And the answer is no, they're the same kind of being. Um, Christ is just at the head. And notice also that they called uh, these other archangels gods, with a little g. Now, this gets back to the idea of how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Because we, like I said before, we believe that they are one uh, in will, love, covenant, that sort of thing. Whereas mainstream Christians would say they're one being, separate persons, but one being. And so that oneness for them is totally different than the oneness that humans can ever experience with God or with each other. But there's only actually one place in the scriptures where the how God is one um, and how humans can be one with God is, is uh, discussed at all or at least very uh, specifically anyway. So this is in John 17, this is the, Jesus' great intercessory prayer where he was praying uh, to intercede for his, his disciples. 
And he prays uh, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So how are the Father and the Son one with each other? Well, he doesn't say exactly, but he says it's the same way that the, the disciples can be one with each other and one in the Father and the Son. I mean, you, you can uh, say, well, uh, it doesn't really mean that, and, 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 you know, we just take different things literally, I guess, uh, from other people. And that's fine, but like I said, this is the only place that really says anything about how the Godhead is one compared to how humans can be one with them. And it seems to indicate it's the same way. Now here's a passage. This is from uh, Justin Martyr. He's a, actually Saint Justin Martyr, so he's a Catholic saint. Um, now he was writing around the middle of the second century, and he was one of the early guys who was really introducing Greek philosophical concepts uh, into Christianity and harmonizing them and so on. Um, but still at the time, there was a huge Jewish Christian uh, influence where he lived in Rome. But he says, there is said to be another God. So the Greek there is Deuteros Theos. It's also translated a second God. And Lord, subject to the maker of all things, who is also called an angel. I shall endeavor to persuade you that he who is said to have appeared to Abraham and to Jacob and to Moses and who is called God is distinct from him who made all things. Numerically, I mean, not distinct in will. So what he's saying is that Jesus is a second God, who we sometimes also call an angel in the scriptures, uh, the scriptures. But he's distinct from the Father, distinct numerically, meaning he's a second person and second being, but not distinct in will. So their oneness is one, complete oneness of will with each other, which is right up our alley. Now, so we, we've talked about, when we were talking about uh, uh, subordinationism, the idea that Jesus and the angels um, are the same kind of being, right? And we talked about how God was thought of as having a material body in human form. Um, but what about this doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, the uh, creation from nothing? Um, because like I said, that is a critical doctrine because it really places uh, what's called an ontological gulf uh, between the, uh, the God and everything else, basically. Now, it turns out that uh, the, the dominant scholarly position right now, of people who study the origin of this doctrine, is that um, it couldn't have existed in the earliest uh, Christianity because it didn't pop up until sometime in the second century. So uh, here is Peter Heyman. He's actually, a, a, I believe, a Jewish scholar. He says, nearly all recent studies on the origin of the doctrine of Cratcho ex nihilo have come to the conclusion that this doctrine is not native to Judaism, is nowhere attested in the Hebrew Bible, and probably arose in Christianity um, in the second century CE in the course of its fierce battle with Gnosticism. So you can see if Gnost the Gnostics believe that the material world is actually evil, and so Jesus didn't actually become uh, incarnate in the flesh, um, it would be a great weapon against them to adopt this idea of creation from nothing. So that way the material world um, came from God, so it can't be inherently bad. So, so anyway, that's, that's how the doctrine origi originated. But you can find, especially in more modern translation, this is the New English Bible, but in the Bible it's pretty clear <laughs> that they believed in creation from chaotic pre-existing matter. For instance, here in uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, he says, there were heavens and earth long ago created by God's word out of water and with water. So there's this watery chaos that they believed existed. Okay, 
So let's move on to, to people. If, if uh, people, I guess, are part of this, uh, you know, the universe that God created as well, uh, okay, great, we're not created out of nothing, but did they believe that we had pre-existing spirits that uh, have been around before we were, were born? And it turns out, yes, in Jewish Christianity, uh, they believe that too. So here's Oregon again, quoting from a Jewish uh, Christian document called prayer, The Prayer of Joseph. And he says, I, Jacob, who speak to you, am an angel of God, a ruling spirit, and Abraham and Isaac were created before every work of God. So once again, they had this idea that uh, at least some of the people uh, that lived on earth were angels in the previous existence before they were born. Here's another passage from uh, the Clementine recognitions. This is Peter, and I think he's talking to Clement here. He says, after all these things he made man on whose account he had prepared all things whose internal species, meaning his spirit, is older, and for whose sake all things that are were made. So once again, standard Jewish Christian document, and they're saying, oh yeah, that your uh, uh, person's spirit is older than their body and existed before, and the rest of creation was uh, brought forth because of that. Now, that comes to the question of, is there still this gulf of separation that God has a type of being that is really completely different than everyone else? Um, that, would, that would affect our, our idea of whether Jesus is really God as well, if, if we believe that he was the same as the angels and the angels are essentially the same as us uh, in nature. Now, we would often point to a passage like this in Acts 17 that's, uh, where uh, Paul says to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. So he calls us the offspring of God. But, you know, God created us, so we take the offspring thing a lot more literally than other people would. Let's look again in the Jewish Christian literature. Here's a passage from the Clementine homilies, and it's Peter speaking again. He says, The bodies of men have immortal souls, which have been clothed with the breath of God, and having come forth from God, they are of the same substance. Now, um, until it's sometime in the fourth century, if a Greek speaking person said this, two things were of the same substance, that meant um, same kind of species right, or the, the ge same generic type of thing. So they're the same substance, but they are not gods. But if they are gods, then in this way, the souls of all men, both those who have died and those who are alive and those who shall come into being are gods. But if in a spirit of controversy, you maintain that these are also are God, what great matter is it then for Christ to be called God? For he has only what we all have. So this one passage, it says, that human spirits are the same generic type of thing as God's spirit. And it also says that Jesus' spirit is the same as ours. So here we have all in one passage uh, confirmation that, that uh, really they didn't see God as, God as a completely separate type of thing from human beings. Now, finally, that brings us to the doctrine of deification. So the idea that uh, men can become gods. Now, I didn't bring in a bunch of extra biblical sources on this one because um, there, I'll just tell you, there are so many of them. There's just tons and tons of these things. And plus, the Orthodox Church and the, Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they say the same thing even now. Men can become gods with the little g, right? The question is, how do we interpret that? And if we have this doctrine of cratio ex nihilo, like I said, it puts this gulf in between us and God that can never be bridged. We can never become uncreated like uh, the Spirit of God is. So, so the question would be, how would the, the early Christians have, have interpreted this, the early Jewish Christians specifically? 
And uh, I believe it's, it's pretty clear if you take all of these other doctrines into account and look at what's actually said in the New Testament about this, that they meant we will become like God. We'll share rule with him. That doesn't mean we won't be under him and under Jesus and things like that, but we'll be right there like him. So, for instance, here's this one from Romans 8, 16 and 17. It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So whatever Christ inherits, we inherit too. And this is literal, right? We really inherit what Christ inherits. In Revelation 3.21, he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. There are some Jewish uh, doc uh, documents from this period where they have angels who dared to sit in the throne of God and they got punished heavily because nobody sits in the throne of God because that represented co-rule with God. Um, and so some of the Jews thought that was heretical and so they, they would uh, um, argue against that. But in the New Testament, the idea uh, that believers can one day sit with God on the throne is not heretical. It's just a description of what they think is going to happen. Here's another one in Revelation 21, uh, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Anyway, this is just a taste of all the things I, I found. What I'm hoping is that um, somebody who has more time than me will get inspired by this because I think what we really need now is a history from a Latter-day Saints uh, perspective of the apostasy uh, by somebody who knows what they're doing. There's a lot of material out there. I, I tried to gather up as much of it as I could, but um, really there's a lot more to do. And when we dig into this thing, I, I think we can really um, be able to show great kinship, at least, between what we believe and what the earliest Christians believe, which is exactly what Joseph Smith's claims imply. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so this question is, is there evidence for Greek philosophy influence in Jewish theology before or during the time of Christ? And the answer is yes. So um, if you look up Philo of Alexandria, so Phi or Philo the Jew, uh, he was a contemporary of Christ, and uh, he lived in Alexandria, so uh, Greek-speaking Egypt, and uh, heavily influenced by, by uh, Greek philosophy, talks about the correspondence between the two. So yeah, the, Gre the Jews had already moved out into the, the Greek-speaking world, so in that sense they had the change had sort of happened already outside of Palestine. And even in Palestine, you can't say that there was no influence because the Greek culture was so pervasive. Okay, somebody says, uh, Paul's statement, uh, this is a comment, not a question. Paul's statement in Athens makes no logical sense unless offspring is taken literally. And I, I would disagree with that. Um, well, yeah, I, I sort of do agree with it that because he's talking about how, uh, so you can't say God is made of stone because we're his, his, his offspring. So, yeah, but there's always a way. There's always a way to, to I, I think we have a good argument is what I'm saying, is that that's how you should interpret that passage. But uh, like I said, different people take different parts of the Bible literally. There's no such thing as one group taking the Bible literally and another one not. We just take different things, literally. We have another question over there, but we can't Let's see if we can get this maybe Hang on a second. So Tad Callister, uh, so it says Tad Callister, what are your thoughts about his book on the apostasy? And the answer is I haven't read it, so I don't I don't know. Um, I, I wrote this book, uh, you know, 
15 years ago or so. And so I sort of moved on to other things and dipped my toe back in it from time to time. Um, but that's one book I didn't uh, read yet, so sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you.